<laughs> yeah, looking at this lesson, there's a good question to ask yourself. Is like, how do you recognize someone who's a Christian? Mm. You'll look throughout the Bible and you'll run across, well, hey, it, you know, Jesus says, well, a Christian, a disciple, you should recognize them by their love, right? It also says, hey, if, if you're following in my footsteps, well, hey, you're going to have to bear much fruit to show yourself to be my disciple. Mm. But then we go back even to a scripture that we all first started off in our faith. Hey, if you're seeking God with all of your heart, you are going to be blessed. Yeah. And we know what that means to be happy. Mm. Yeah. But sometimes we, we look around and we're like, well, hey, there are some people who are Christians. They're doing the deed, but they're not happy. Mm. And so tonight we're going to be talking about that. My lesson tonight is simply titled, Why Christians Are Unhappy. Yes. Mm. So what does it mean to be happy? Well, the definition is, is feeling or showing pleasure or contentment. Mm -hmm. Other words you might use um, is content, cheerful, cheery, merry, joyful, jolly, joking around, carefree, untroubled. And, you know, it talks about that this is how it should describe your life as a Christian. Mm -hmm. We can kind of partner this with Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Mm. Against such things, there is no law. You know, when you see a Christian and you look at them and compare themselves to who they were before, we know some things are like, okay, well, they, they need to start changing their behavior of their life. They need to repent, right? They need to start, okay, sharing their faith, coming to church, doing these things. But it also says that we need to see that they're going to change their attitude and their joy level in their heart. Mm -hmm. It says here that the fruits of the Spirit, in, in particular, is joy and peace. In other words, products of the Holy Spirit. So it can be reasonable to expect that those who have become Christians should have act actions of kindness and self-control and a change of behavior, but we also should expect that their hearts change and their attitudes change as well. And we know through, throughout the scriptures it talks about that. You know, in Galatians 5, it talks about that we should be joyful. Yeah. And we should have peace in our hearts. You know, in Matthew 6, that Christians shouldn't be worried. We should have faith in God's promises. Hebrews 13, verse 5, we should be content in our lives. Romans 12, verse 16, that we need to be humble and value others above ourselves. 1 Timothy 6, 18, we need to be generous. And 1 Peter 5, verse 2, is that we need to be willing to do the good in our lives. So the harsh truth is that we must accept and believe that unhappiness as a Christian is not a product of God. Nor is it caused by God. Nor is it because we are following His commandments. Sometimes we can convince ourselves, well, hey... I'm unhappy because of all of the commitment I have towards God. Mm. But let's look at what the Bible says about God's commitment and His love mm -hmm. and what He's calling us to do. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 through 3, it says, This is how we know that we love the that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. Read again, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think what's awesome about these scriptures is sometimes you can kind of ask somebody, is like, hey, how do you feel about God's commands? How do you feel about taking on God's burdens. But what I love about these scriptures is not depicting of how someone feels about them. It's simply stating them as fact. He says, hey, his commands are not burdensome. I don't care how you feel about it. This is a fact from God. The commands are not burdensome. Jesus talks about his yoke. He doesn't say it feels easy. It's going to feel great. No, he's saying it is easy. My burden is light. These are the two facts that he gives us here in these scriptures. So when we come up to a Christian, so wait, why are Christians unhappy then? Mm. We come up to that, and the thing is, is to answer this question, question, we must first take 
the blame off of God and put it on the right person. Mm. So understanding why a Christian's unhappy, we're going to look at point number one first, is God is not the problem. Mm. Come on, Sean. All right, Numbers 23, or number 23, verse 19. It says, God is not a human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? According to this verse, it's just talking about God's character, that he doesn't lie, that he doesn't have a promise that he's made to you and doesn't fulfill. He doesn't change his mind. Therefore, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, when he talked about that each and every disciple that was baptized should have the Holy Spirit, and then that Holy Spirit should produce fruit of peace and joy in them, that means that is a promise that God is going to fulfill in you. Well, if God has promised this, and he stated that, that he's going to give you the Holy Spirit in baptism, then why are Christians still unhappy? That's, that's, that's a valid question, right? Yeah. Well... To answer this question, let's look at the example using Matthew 9, verse 37. So we're going to read this about what Jesus says about the, 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 the harvest being plentiful. It says to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Right? The, the, even though the harvest was plentiful here, would they reap the harvest if the workers weren't out there gathering it? Of course not, right? Just because the harvest is plentiful, being out there in abundance, doesn't mean you're going to reap it if you're not out there working for it. Yeah. See, just as God in Galatians 5.22 said that the fruits of the Spirit is joy and peace, but the harvest is plentiful, means that we still need to work to enjoy that fruit. The harvest requires workers of faith to gather the plenty. You know, a lack of evangelism and faith in action would limit the harvest. In, in getting disciples. In the same way, our lack of keeping in step with the Spirit will lack the plenty that God is trying to give you in peace and joy. You know, there's this funny story not long ago about um, in America, they have this kind of good news, uh, the, the Tournament of Roses, where it's like this good news parade in New York. And I know I may have told this story before, but it's quite funny. So they're going around. They make these big, huge floats, these companies. You know, you'll have one of like McDonald's or something for Disneyland and everything. But uh, years ago, there was this uh, company that made this float. And right in the beginning, after like a mile into the parade, it runs out of petrol. It runs out of gas. And so it, it ruined kind of like the whole parade. Everyone's running around. They had to go get it because it wasn't easy to get the gas back in there because there's like hundreds of people on the, on the sides of the road. But the funny thing about it is the company that made that float was a petrol company. Oh, no. <laughs> and though that company had all the plenty in the world, they were still lacking gas. See, mm -hmm. Galatians 5.25, it continues on saying, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That often Christians can have the plenty at their fingertips. But when we neglect our spiritual maintenance, though we are clothed with power, we find ourselves running out of gas. Mm -hmm. And the same way, we can have it all at our fingertips, but we, we, we need to have that spiritual maintenance in our life, keeping in step with the Spirit. See, it's the same with the fruits of the Spirit. It is given to Christians in plenty. God doesn't stop giving the Spirit from producing joy and peace in us, but we do. Every disciple must come to this conviction that their unhappiness is not caused by God. It is not by Him, but rather it is by ourselves or the reaction to a situation or an environment in their lives. Mm. So let's investigate some of the traps that Christians can kind of get fall into um, in leading them to unhappiness. Mm. Point number two, you're unhappy because you don't have what you want. Mm. See, this is probably true of most anybody who's ever unhappy, right? Um, if we ever, excuse me, if we're even just unhappy for a moment, it's usually because we don't have something that we want. Maybe we want to feel good or feel happy, but we don't really, so we're unhappy. Maybe we want a better job or more money. We don't, so we're unhappy. Maybe we want a great marriage or, or to be dating. We don't have that, so we're unhappy. Mm. You know, we want to be around people that we love or people that we miss. And for some reason or not, we can't, and so we're unhappy. So, what should we do 
if we are unhappy because we don't have something that we want. But the Bible teaches us here in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. It says, but godliness with contentment mm. is great gain. Yeah. For we brought nothing into this world and we can bring nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. I love that, that that's, what, that's what the scripture says. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm -hmm. Meaning godliness without contentment, you're still missing something. Mm -hmm. You haven't gained as much as you could. It, it, it's great, it's awesome, you've changed, but you're not content, you're still, you're still bitter, you're still not happy with it. That, that, you're not gaining much in your life. Mm -hmm. People can change, but we need to be happy about that. Simply put, you need to, you need to want what you have. Not anything more. Because we understand that the Bible teaches us that, you know, to be content, but as well as that God has given us everything that we need. And so, in, in turn, we need to want what we already have. We already need to want what God has already provided for us. In that, we will find contentment in our lives. See, sometimes we have to acknowledge the fact that we don't have everything we want, but we do have everything we need in Christ. Learn to want what you have, and you won't be concerned about what you don't have. So that's the first trap that we can fall into. Mm -hmm. Second trap is point number three. You're not happy because you're not doing things God's way. Oh, wow. See, sometimes unhappiness comes from experiencing the consequences of poor choices. Mm -hmm. Think about it, when somebody drinks all night and they wake up in the morning and hung over, they're like, they, they feel bad. Right? They can't be like, why did God let me do that? Right? It, that, that was your choice. Now, sometimes facing the consequences of your bad choices is a good thing. Yeah. So you'll be like, okay, I know not to do that anymore. Um, so experiencing painful consequences is often our motivation to change our lives. But if you're unhappy at some point in your life, sometimes you just need to ask yourself this question. Did I cause this situation? Mm. What did I do before this happened? Maybe try to retrace your steps and see if there's anything that you've done that wasn't in God's way or, or God ordained. If your unhappiness was caused by your own sin, then just own it. That's awesome. When you get to that point in your life, then you realize you're the problem, but you're also the solution. Mm. That's, that's a good place to be sometimes. Where you're like, hey, I'm unhappy because of things that I'm doing. I should probably just stop doing that. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a good step. In your life on, you don't just repent from your sin so stop making the same bad choices that brought you to that point of unhappiness mm -hmm. and start doing things God's way doing things God's way does not mean you'll never experience pain or suffering we know that mm -hmm. but you will experience at least far less pain and suffering in your life because you'll stop bringing it upon yourself mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so, so it's not just God training you and you facing your own consequence it's just leaving it up to God to face that, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Uh, the third trap that we can fall into is point number four. You're not happy because you're being ungrateful. Wow. You know, and this is something that we have to look into is sometimes, you know, you can wonder, how could you ever think life is horrible? Don't you know what we deserve? Mm. You know, not only each and every single one of us deserves death um, because each one of us has sinned, but not just physically. But we all deserve eternal death, eternity in hell. You know, and I, I know I've said this quote many times, but every moment that you're not living in the agony of hell is a moment you don't deserve. Mm -hmm. Once we fully grasp that in our hearts and realize that every single waking breath that we have, we need to be grateful for, that, 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 that will change your life. Mm -hmm. You'll never be not content anymore. You'll never be like, I want something more. I want this. I want this to be changed. It would all be like, wow, I can't believe I woke up today. Mm -hmm. God, give me more problems is better than hell. Like, th th that, that would change your life. Mm -hmm. And understand that not only did he not just spare us from the flames of hell, but what does he say? It says, Jesus came down here in John 10, 10. If a thief comes to steal and destroy, I have come instead so that many would have life and have it to the full. Wow, that's crazy. That not only did he just spare you from death, but he said, hey, I'm going to give you life and have it to the full. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. How grateful should we be? You know, so the greatest way of turning, or the best way of turning our frown, you know, upside down, 
Because remembering how, uh, remembering how blessed we truly are. And start praising God for everything that we have. And it won't be long when we start to feel that unhappiness kind of drain away from us. That everything that happened in our life, remember, didn't happen to us, it happened for us. Mm. That, that God has been building us up into the person that we need to become to face these different things. Mm. And it will change our hearts just from being ungrateful to grateful and saying, God, thank you for everything you are doing in my life. Number four is point number five. You're unhappy because you're being selfish. Mm. You know, if I ask you, who are you trying to make happy? And you answer myself, then I would respond, that's your problem. Hmm. Right? Whenever you focus on yourself, you're destined to be unhappy. Because all you're looking at is what you want. And what happens when you do that? You make everyone else unhappy because you're not really loving other people. And unloved people don't really want to love you back. And because that, you don't feel very loved. And that makes you not very happy. And so it's just, it just goes around and around and around. In the same way, when you're trying to make yourself happy, and you're not really loving God how he wants to be loved, then you feel like, oh, wow, if I'm not loving God, does he really love me? And then you start doubting your relationship. And guess what? It makes you unhappy again. And so in every single form, when you're loving yourself, it's, it's not that people aren't really doing that. You just start doubting your own happiness. You start doubting the love that you're showing other people. You know, so when you focus on yourself, you are destined to chase these things but never really reach it. It's only when you stop focusing on yourself and focusing on what God's calling us to do, then you can really experience true happiness and satisfaction in your own life. Galatians 2.20 talks about this. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't live for myself anymore. I've given that up. I'm simply here living for God, and we get to see how that's changed Paul's life. You read about what this guy went through, you're like, dang, I would have been unhappy. <laughs> you know, you read that. Shipwreck, we could probably, you know, we read shipwreck, he's been flogged, he's been arrested. Most of us, we're like, man, I would have been unhappy just if I was hungry. <laughs> you know? We read that list and we're like, dang, like that, 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 that got me there already. But yet we understand that he stopped living for himself. He stopped thinking about himself, and that's why he was able to face all these small and, and, and large things in his life and saying, hey, I'm content. I, I don't think about myself anymore. So when you die to yourself, then you can experience true happiness and contentment that transcends all of your circumstances. When you live to please him and do his will, you will experience true happiness and joy. You will never find true and lasting happiness in a you know, romantic relationship, in money, in more stuff, or in a better job, or whatever else you can fill in the blank with. The only place you can find true happiness is in Christ and when you truly start living for Him. Mm. You know, but at the end of it, and I think this is one that most of us can kind of fall in the trap in, is, you know, point number six, our fifth trap, is you're not happy because you're comfortable being unhappy. Mm. You might be saying, wait a minute, no, nobody wants to be unhappy. Okay, that's that's true. Nobody wants to be unhappy, but people are comfortable being unhappy. Yeah. I don't know if you ever had that point where you were unhappy and you're like, man, feeling bad kind of feels good a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Where you're, you're almost at the brink of crying or maybe you're feeling sad or depressed in your life and someone came and tried to make you smile or laugh and you got mad at them. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about right there. Where you're like, man, stop ruining my unhappiness. <laughs> like, I was going great. This was going awesome. I felt great doing this. Stop with your you know, it, it, it's that we're, we're comfortable feeling unhappy. You know, some people, again, aren't, are comfortable being unhappy because they don't want to face the pain of changing. Wow. You know, it's a, they, they, they would rather stay in unhappiness than face the pain that's going to have to change to be happy. You know, it is, it is hard making the, uh, making the necessary changes to become a happy person. You know, after dying to yourself, it's, it's a hard thing. Most of our lives as a Christian, we're going to be learning how to do that more and more and more. Um, but I think it's going to be a lot harder living a miserable life. That, that's, that's definitely the, the worst of both evils in a way. And it's going to be especially harder living a miserable eternity. So this is something that we have to accept, that our unhappiness is sometimes our own choice, and we allow ourselves to be unhappy. 
See, some of the reasons why Christians choose to be unhappy is sometimes they believe in this false doctrine to, to be happy or joyful means that you're doing some sin or unrighteousness. Or that, uh, that uh, they must be doing something wrong if they're feeling good. You know, they think like, oh, well, if, I, if I'm having joy and happiness, that means I'm not denying myself. Maybe I'm not really being a Christian. No. Sometimes denying yourself means deny yourself unhappiness. Yeah. That's something that you probably want sometimes in your life. You've got to deny yourself that and actually just be happy. So we have to believe that, you know, feeling good or feeling content and feeling joyful, those are not false doctrines. Those are things that actually God wants for our lives. Mm -hmm. That God wants us to have a happy life. God wants us to be joyful. God wants us to feel these things. You know, and so we need to uh, get away that false doctrine in our life and accept the true doctrine of that we are called to be happy. We are called to show joy in our life. So you're going to have to ask yourself the question, do I really want to be happy? Am I willing to do the necessary things to be happy? If so, I would encourage you to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 2 through 12. I was talking about the Beatitudes that Jesus talked about there on the mount. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, re you replace every word blessed with superlatively happy. Mm -hmm. And this is really cool. Once you actually do that is you start to change your mind of how it's gonna, you're going to be happy. Because sometimes people will, will, will read something like this and be like, okay, so you're teaching me I need to just go be happy. So I'm just going to go watch a lot of movies. I'm going to go get my favorite food. I'm going to go get it. No, I'm not ch teaching you to chase pleasure. Yeah. I'm teaching you to get happy. Yeah. And what's really cool is when you read throughout Jesus and, and him talking about the Beatitudes, you read that and you're like, does Jesus know what he's talking about? <laughs> yeah. So it says here, for me to go be happy, I need to find someone to persecute me. Okay. Jesus, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> you know, like, like it's really cool because once you start reading that, to be neat, to be, to, to, be, uh, to be those that are in sorrow, it's like Jesus starts teaching us differently of how to have a lasting happiness. And go through that and really study it in your heart. It's like, do I believe that these things will give me happiness? Do I believe that, that it can change me from an unhappy person to a happy person? So I really encourage you, go throughout that and find out what Jesus calls us to do to have lasting happiness. Mm. But in conclusion, I really love this scripture that I think helps us just practically of how to get happiness into our lives quickly. Philippians 4, 4 through 9. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whether you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. I love what this scripture is practically teaching. And I know I say it all the time, but there are so many people that have convinced themselves that I can't change how I feel. I can't change what I think. It's just my mind. It's just my heart. I don't know how to change it. This scripture denounces that false doctrine. Mm. He starts off in the beginning with rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Meaning here, he's saying, even if you don't want to rejoice, you don't feel like rejoicing, just do it. Mm. Meaning you can decide how you feel. You can decide what emotions you want to portray in your actions. Just do it. Let your gentleness be evident. Let your rejoicing be evident. Rejoice means to show your happiness. Right? It doesn't mean just be happy. It means show it, rejoice, and do it always. How that helps change our hearts is sometimes we just try to do it eternally, but not externally. And so our internal doesn't change because we're not trying to do it out internal. We look at that one person who's always happy, jumping around, and we're like, why is he always like that? Well, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. It changes the internal. So he's saying, first, you have the ability to change how you feel on the inside. Just do it outside. Yeah. Then sometimes people even get that false doctrine. Well, Hey, I can't, I, I don't know how to change my thoughts. It's my thoughts. It's just how I think. Mm. He's saying here, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, think about those things. Mm. You have the ability to change what you think about. Mm. And so what this really teaches us in conclusion 
is that we have the ability to make the decision to live a happy life, wow. to think about good things, to feel good things in our life. And if you're falling into any one of those traps, whether you're comfortable being unhappy, whether we're, we're, not, we're not being uh, grateful in our lives, or we want something, or whatever it may be, fill in the blank. Maybe there's about like 10 other, other different traps that Satan can get us into yeah. of, of thinking that as a Christian we shouldn't be that happy. But instead, realize what the scriptures are calling to us. Have a conviction about joy and peace in your life. And let's make that decision each and every day to rejoice always, and as well as to think about the good things that God is giving us. And thank you very much. Thank you.